subject of this video is the rectus and sinister nomenclature system for naming chiral centers and the conjugal prelog substitute priority rules that allow you to make that determination. In most cases, it's not correct to talk, talk about a molecule as being an R or an S isomer, unless it's just a single chiral center, in which case the molecule could be described as an R isomer because one chiral center is all you're talking about. But normally, uh, a molecule will have multiple chiral centers, or in many cases, multiple chiral centers, each of which will have an R or S nomenclature, so you can't actually say whether the molecule itself is R or S. So the conjugal prelog substitution priority rules are very simple. They're the same, they're based on the same principle as football recruiting, which is size matters. The bigger substituent gets the higher priority. But it's not the total size of the substituent that matters, it's the size of the atom that's directly attached. So to take one of the simple examples, we have a molecule that has the three halogens, iodine, chlorine, and bromine. Attached to carbon. This is the carbon that now has four different substituents. And since it has four different substituents, it's a chiral center. And it will be not superimposable on its mirror image. So I would number these according to the atomic number, the size of the nucleus of the directly attached atom. In this case, it's simple because in each substituent, there's only a single atom anyway. Iodine is the heaviest halogen, so that would be my top priority. Bromine would be next. Chlorine would be the third priority. And hydrogen, just a protium, right, with a single proton and no neutrons is always the last priority substituent. So hydrogen loses to everybody. Hydrogen even loses to uh, heavy hydrogen or deuterium, which has one proton and one neutron, which would be abbreviated with a D. Right? So I've numbered my substituents. I have iodine, bromine, chlorine, and then hydrogen as my fourth priority substituent. In order to name this as R or S, I need to put myself so that I'm looking down the bond from the carbon to whatever the fourth priority substituent is. So in essence, I want to look at a human projection looking down this carbon-hydrogen bond. So I'll put my carbon in the front. My hydrogen atom will be represented by this back circle. So I'm rotating this molecule 90 degrees so that I'm looking down the carbon-hydrogen bond. And if I do that, my iodine is on the top. The 
thing that's in the plane of the board will be on the vertical. The chlorine which was out in front will now be on the right. And the bromine, which was in the back, will be on the left. And this center circle is the hydrogen. So I'm looking from the carbon to the hydrogen, and then I'm tracing from the top part of your substituent to the second part of your substituent to the third part of your substituent. And as I go from the first priority to the second priority to the third priority of substituent and then back to the first priority of substituent, this is a counterclockwise motion. Which means it's the S stereo center. Which in this case, since there is only one chiral center, needs it's also the S isomer of the molecule. So if I were to name this compound, I would name it S, and that goes in parentheses. Bromo, chloro, iodo, methane. Where my substituents are named in alphabetical order, where we come B before C, C before I, and then methane because it's a single carbon. So this is the S isomer because the substituent priorities from 1 to 2 to 3 force you into a counterclockwise motion. It's not always easy to rotate the molecule and draw a Newman projection for it because sometimes you're working with a molecule that's got a complicated three-dimensional structure. So eventually you need to get comfortable with the idea of mentally putting yourself kind of into the plane of the board without banging your head too hard and tracing from one to two to the back behind the board and you're rotating your hand in a little circle and that's going in a counterclockwise direction. It's most difficult when the hydrogen is pointing out of the board, in which case you kind of have to mentally put yourself behind the board. You'll need a model set. The easiest way to do this is to actually make a model that you can rotate in your hand so you're looking the right way down the bond, and then eventually you'll get comfortable with just popping into three dimensions in your head. So it was easy in this case because there was only a single atom attached in each case. But what if I have a molecule like possible stereoisomers of 2,3-dichloropentane based on the relative positions of the substituents attached. Carbon-2 here is attached to four different substituents, a methyl group here, a 1-chloropropyl group here, a chlorine and a hydrogen, so that's a chiral center, and carbon-3 is also a chiral center. It's attached to an ethyl group, to a 1-chloroethyl group, to a chlorine and to a hydrogen. So we have two chiral centers, which actually means that we have a possible maximum of two to the n, where n is the number of chiral centers, video you know that you won't necessarily always have four stereoisomers 
because you might have a meso compound where you have a mirror image that's actually superimposable on itself and is therefore just one compound. Uh, but this molecule has four stereocenters because there's not enough symmetry to actually create a meso compound. So we need to be able to say which of those four stereoisomers we're working with by defining the stereochemistry at carbon two and the stereochemistry at carbon three. Right? So the first thing we would do is we would know that hydrogen is always the lowest priority substituent. So I can safely number the hydrogen as substituent four in both at both carbon two and carbon three. Chlorine is bigger than carbon, which means that this chlorine is going to outrank both of the carbons. And that's going to be true at carbon three as well. Chlorine is bigger than either of the two carbons. But now I'm connected to carbon twice in both of these situations. So I have to determine which carbon gets the higher priority. And that means that instead of looking at the directly attached atom, I need to proceed to the next atom. So we keep going until we get to the first point of difference. isomer 
of 2,3-dichloropentane. If I'm putting myself in the back of the board and I'm doing this from one to two to three, right, I'm kind of moving that, and then I just have to rotate myself so that I'm behind my rotating hand. So I'm doing that and I'm walking around behind it, and that's an R stereo center, it's a clockwise rotation. It looks here as if it's a counterclockwise motion, but that's because we're looking the wrong way down the bottom. So you have to be very careful to make sure you're looking the right way down the bond when you're determining whether the stereo center is R or S. That was also a fairly straightforward example. Because there wasn't very much ambiguity, we hit the same, or we hit the, a difference at the second connection.
But because it has chiral centers, it's defined as a meso compound. Meso compound has chiral centers, plural. Got to have at least two in order to be a meso compound. But it is itself. And the reason for that is because it is superimposable on its mirror image. If I were to draw the mirror image of this compound, the two chlorines are coming up. Compound, all I would have to do to superimpose this compound on that one is flip it 180 degrees in this direction so that the two hydrogens that are back would come up and the two chlorines which are up would come back. That's a superimposable mirror image. Anytime you have an internal plane of symmetry, you will in fact be superimposable on your mirror image, which means they will not be chiral centers. And you'll notice that when you have a molecule with this kind of symmetry, where the two substituents in this case are both chlorine, one of the stereocentric is S, and the other one is R. The SS stereochemistry would not be superimposable by the mirror image. So let's draw the SS isomer and the RR isomer and confirm that they are, in fact, not superimposable on the mirror image, and thus a pair of enantiomers. Usually, when you set out to draw a specific stereoisomer, it's hard to draw that isomer directly. But in this case, it's pretty easy because we know that the S stereocenter carbon 1 is the one that has the chlorine in the back and the hydrogen in the front. So if we want to switch and have the SS isomer, we simply need to switch the two substituents and have the chlorine coming out and the hydrogen going back. Chlorine is number one. The CH2 that's attached to the carbon with chlorine is second. The CH2 that's not attached to the carbon, right? So carbon two here outranks carbon four. And going from chlorine to this CH2 to this CH2 is a counterclockwise rotation. So this is the SS isomer. And then to draw the enantiomer, I simply draw the mirror image. Here, if this is the SS isomer, and this is the RR isomer, because enantiomers will differ at every chiral center. Do not reflect into each other, and they differ at just one of the two stereocenters. 
you have multiple stereo centers, you might differ two. But you know, if you have five stereo centers, you could differ two and be a diet stereo, or you could differ three and be a diet stereo. It turns out that if you differ at just one, there's another term for that called epigram, um, then that will be relevant to sugar chemistry in the second semester. So these are not superimposable. If we were to rotate this around 180 degrees around this axis, so that the chlorine is attached to the carbon that's on the right, this chlorine back and the hydrogen up. And here, right, it would bring the hydrogen back. And the chlorine up. That's not the same. this so that the chlorine was up, I could rotate around this axis. And that gives the chlorine, puts the chlorine in the same location as the chlorine in the other enantiomer. But now this chlorine is not going to be attached to that carbon anymore. It's going to be attached to this carbon. It's over here. Right? And since I rotated it, it's going back. That's also not the same as that compound. There's no way that I'm going to superimpose those compounds on each other. In fact, if I were to rotate 180 degrees around this axis, the one connecting carbon 2 to carbon 5, I would find that this chlorine becomes that chlorine. It's up front here would go back. This hydrogen would become that hydrogen. So when I rotate 180 degrees around this axis, the molecule becomes itself. That's referred to as, as a C2 axis of symmetry. Twice in a 360 degree rotation, the molecule becomes itself. And when you have that C2 axis of symmetry, and it's the only symmetry operation that's present in the molecule, it is almost always a chiral molecule. So an internal plane of symmetry is a sufficient condition to make a molecule achiral, and the presence of only a C2 axis of symmetry and no other symmetry elements is generally a sufficient condition to cause something to be one of a pair of enantiomers and have a non superimposed so there are three possible stereoisomers of 1,3-dichlorocyclohexane. 1S3R is the cis isomer, and then 1S3S and 1R3R are both trans 1,3-dichlorocyclohexanes. Thank you.